what it means to follow after God. The question this morning, are you thirsty? This water that Jesus spoke about is spiritual life. And to experience spiritual life, you have to drink the living water, which is the word of God. And if you're not, if you're sitting here today, or if you're watching me this morning on live stream, and you're not drinking the living water, which is the word of God, what happens? To quench that thirst, when you run or hike up Camelback Mountain, you quench your thirst, but something on the inside is still not quenched. Now, it's not something you do on Sunday morning, and that's it. No, it's an ongoing process. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling alone, when you're feeling empty on the inside, when even your children, your wife or your husband doesn't give you pleasure, that's God speaking to you. He's letting you know your tank is low. You need to come and drink some living water because you're not experiencing the love and the joy that I've given you. It has nothing to do with the outside. It has something to do with the inside. And no one can drink the water of life if we neglect a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can go out there. You can be successful. You can have a beautiful family. You get together like today on birthdays and holidays, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to be sitting at that birthday party, you're going to be sitting at that wedding, and guess what? There's no joy on the inside. You may have a smile for a season, but then once the, the, the thing is over, the smile goes away. When you neglect that relationship, now, I hate to say this, but there's some here right now there are some going to be watching me today. If you don't have an ear to hear God's word, or you're sitting here and you say, Pastor, I don't even have a need for God. I'm okay just the way I am. I look at my house. I look at my family. I look at my bank account. I don't have a need for God. You are able to exist without any higher power because it can't touch you. That's what you're feeling. And God is saying today, I believe these verses speak to somebody, though. I believe somebody sitting here today has been looking for something, and you've been looking in the wrong places. You thought when you had what you have was going to sustain you and fill you up, and you still find yourself thirsty. Yeah. You're dry on the inside. But now, I think this invitation is for everyone. Everybody sitting here. And as you listen to the word of God, it's going to make you aware of the need that we have, which is more of Jesus. Amen. Don't try to satisfy your... your uh, your desires by worldly things because it only gives you temporary relief. It only makes you hungrier for God because once you obtain what you strive for and you sweat it for, and you, at the end of the day you sit home and say, man, there's something missing. That's the Holy Spirit crying out to you. He's saying, listen, Tony, Yes, you're doing everything right. Praise God. But you're not longing after me. And I'm the only one that's going to fill you up. I'm the only one that's going to satisfy your quenched. But there are people here this morning, you really don't want forgiveness. You don't even want holiness. What does holiness mean? Walking right with God. You want to be able to come to church on Sunday and live like the devil from Monday to Saturday and then repent and start the cycle all over again. That's why we see people here. I really don't want God. I don't need God. 
I'm not being critical, folks. I'm just telling it like it is. If you're not truly thirsty, and I'm not talking about an outward thirst, water. I'm talking about an inward thirst. That's the Holy Spirit is going to quench that thirst. It's going to satisfy you. And you may have nothing on the outside, but you are going to have perfect peace on the inside. And when your friends and family start to notice something different about you, your outward signs may not have changed. But something in the twinkling of your eye, they sense something. And they want to come to church because they want to hear a life-changing message that speaks to the heart, not to your brain. Because sometimes we have a habit of analyzing things. No, God wants to get to your heart. That's when the Holy Spirit starts to take away the stuff that's holding you back. My wife talked about raising hands. It's not something the Assemblies of God teaches us when I went to Bible school. It's about raising our hands to a holy God, thanking him that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that one day when we close our eyes for the last time, we're going to be standing in his presence. That's why I raise my hands. I'm just thanking him, Lord. Thank you. I woke up this morning and I have air in my lungs. Thank you, Lord, that I'm able to come to church and hear a word of God. Thank you, Lord, that all my needs are met. Thank you, Lord, that I'm healthy. Now, whether or not you're moved to repentance this morning, and I'm going to speak about what repentance means. I mean, whether or not you're moved, listen. You will never, ever, ever be totally happy until you come to the point of repentance. You can try all you want. You can try until hell breaks forward. And guess what? You won't be happy. And whether or not you decide this morning, you say, Pastor, I've been coming to church here and there, but guess what? I am not really moved by your messages. Sorry to disillusion you. It's not my message that, that should touch you. It's the word of God. So you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting the word of God. And if God can't touch you, who can? Am I making sense? How vain people search for satisfaction. They go out on Saturday, which is their day off, and they have a list. From the minute they walk, wake up until the minute they go to bed, they have activities. Because they can't stand to sit idle and do nothing. So they go out there and try to muster up some activities so they can satisfy the hunger and thirst that's longing in their hearts, not realizing it's never going to happen because the next day you wake up and you're still in the same empty state you were the day before. And they engage themselves and they're looking for things to fill them up on the inside. Look around you. Look on your jobs. Look at your homes, your family gatherings. What do you see? People spending all of their energy and their infections on things as we just read in Isaiah chapter 55, 1 and 2. But there's no bread. There's no bread. There's no living water. You've been searching and grabbing a hold of straws and there's no satisfaction. Have you got those scriptures on the board again? Can you put them up? Put Isaiah 55, 1 and 2 again. Look with me. If anyone thirsty, come and drink. Jesus this morning is saying, he's speaking to us. If you're sitting here and watching me and listening and you're thirsty and something on the inside is dry and you're not excited about coming to church, you're not excited about lifting up hands, well, you're thirsty. And he's saying here, even if you have no money, come 
take your choice of the wine and milk. By the way, the wine back then was unfermented. It was like grape juice. So don't go home and say, hey, pastor, man, wants me to go out there and get some wine. <laughs> Want me to get drunk. He said, then I'll feel happy. Yeah, baby. And that's, not what I, that's not what the author is saying. Go to the next verse. Why spend your money on food? Why spend your money on entertainment? Why spend your money on sports? Why spend your money on anything that you do? It does not give you strength. Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me. And you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest foods. And the finest food is the word of God. Can I get an amen? amen. If you don't, it has no lasting effect. Put up verse 3. Incline your ear and come to me. That's what he's saying to you and I. Great that you're here, but where is your heart? Is your heart this morning hearing this message, all of a sudden something is starting to attract you and say, whoa, pastor, this makes sense. I never saw it that way, but I want to spend my ear into listening to what God is speaking to us individually in our hearts and I will make an everlasting covenant. That word covenant is he's going to make a promise. He's going to make a promise. And by the way, God never breaks his promises. Okay? How many of you have broken your promise? No, don't raise your hand. According to the faithful mercies he's shown to David. Hallelujah. God created us. And the Bible says you have a spirit and a soul. But I see people trying to fill and fill and fill themselves with things that have no satisfaction. Hey, listen, folks. A lot of you know my past. I was a drug addict for many, many, many years. I was an alcoholic for many, many, many years. I was even into pornography. I had a triple header. Why? If I had one, I did the other because I was looking for something to satisfy my empty soul, but at the age of 33, I found Jesus, and my whole life turned around. Now my soul is satisfied. I quenched that thirst, and every day, I spoke about it last week. I spoke about these cars that I saw at the Arizona Mills parking lot, and they have these stands where cars, electric cars, would go and plug in. And I didn't know what they were. So me being very inquisitive, I stopped and said, what are you doing? I thought they were selling drugs. I don't know. Oh, we're, we're filling up our batteries. Why are you doing that? Don't you, you want a jump start? He says, no, I need to plug in. And it dawned on me, you and I need to plug in. A lot of us run our cars, and we run, and we run, and we run, and at the end of the day, we are not satisfied. Why? Because you have no gas in your tank, or your battery is run low, and it's empty, and there's no satisfaction. You feed and feed your souls on things that don't quench your hunger. You work. 60 hours, 70 hours a week, hoping that that extra money will fill your empty soul. And it lies to you because at the end of the day, all you have is a sweaty brow and you have to pay more taxes of the money you earned. I put it this way. It's like an ocean. If you've ever been to the beach, Rocky Point or California Beach, and you see the water coming in, it's like you going at the edge of the water and start drinking in the salt water, but it never quenches your thirst because it's salt water. 
they'll destroy you. But yet we find many Christians out there trying to solve their thirst by drinking something that's not right, by doing something that's wrong, by trying to fill their time. When Jesus says, I am the only one. I'm a jealous God. I'm not going to allow you to enjoy yourself without me being first in your life. Because the minute you put Jesus in your life as the beginning, then everything seems to fall into place. The husband, the wife, the children, the church, not in that order. And all of a sudden, everything seems to go well. And whether or not you obtain riches, it don't matter. Why? Whatever we earn on earth does not compare to what's waiting for us in heaven. The Bible says in Revelation that the streets are paved with gold. Your house is going to be like the size of a football field made of solid gold. So solid you can see through it. And you won't even need curtains, wives. Praise God. Am I making sense? But I see a lot of people. They have a soul trying to satisfy. I see you walk in. I know some of you are going to do this. Don't look at me. He's talking to me. Wife, what did you tell him? Husband, what did you say, wife? What it is, is you go to the places that you're not supposed to be and do the things you're not supposed to be. I see a lot of Christians like that. They're restless. They can't sit still. They got to be doing something. They think by doing something, it's going to fill the void. But all it does is to create a new void. I know. I get restless too. So what I do? I hop in my RV. I go to my Jeep. I sit in there. My RV, I've been trying to go on vacation for the longest time. But we're trying to build this church. So what I do is when I get restless, I go sit in my RV. Hoping that would alleviate my stress. But you know what I find out? It does no good. Because what happens is, at that moment when we become restless, it's the Holy Spirit triggering something in your lifestyle that says, you need to get closer to God, not sit in your RV. Your RV can't, so can't quench the thirst that you have for me. So I run back home. And I praise him. I said, thank you, Lord. Don't let me substitute my RV or my Jeep for you. It's not the drive that I need. I need more of Jesus. I need to go get plugged in. Listen, we try to satisfy these feelings and the emotions that we go through. That's running through you. But really, it's a cry of your soul. Your soul is crying out to you. And there's nothing you can buy, nothing that you can obtain, nothing that you can do, nothing that you can have is going to fill that void that's in you. Oh, it'll occupy your time. It may take money out of your pockets. But God made it that way. I didn't get it. For 33 years, I just didn't get it until I found Jesus. I tell my wife, my wife and I, we're the most boringest couple around. Our entertainment is taking a walk. When she able to get me out of bed to take a walk, because I'm kind of lazy on that one. We have a mountain right over here, and I say, <sighs> Manana. <laughs> Some of us here, though, are not walking with God. Why are you spending so much time, energy, effort, money, worry, fear, and you obtain no bread? Why do we spend time trying to fill those moments of emptiness and desire and the answer doesn't come to you? 
God has the answer for the cry and emptiness of our souls. If you lend an ear and hear what the Spirit has to say, we can fight tooth and nail. You can argue with your wife, your husband. You can even kick the dog, but it ain't going to solve the problem. It's your soul crying out for more of Jesus. I asked you a question this morning. If that's you so far, what are you doing about it? Praise God, you're here. But does Jesus really have your heart this morning? Or are you just here because somebody invited you? Or you had nothing else to do this morning? Or you're planning on going someplace else? Does Jesus have our hearts? Has God put a thirst inside you this morning and has touched your soul? That, Lord, you say, Lord, I want you now more than ever. Have you listened to people's advice when you're going through a troubled time and, and you're struggling with your finances or you're struggling with your marriage or you're struggling with your children and you pick up the phone or you, you pick up uh, the Internet and you call on somebody and say, hey, can you give me some advice? I'm going through this problem, and it doesn't seem to go away. Listen, folks. They may be able to give you some advice today, but they don't know what's coming tomorrow, and they can't solve it. Am I making sense? Listen, when we try to satisfy those feelings, it ain't going to work. Only God can control tomorrow. And we're not even guaranteed tomorrow. Today, we live for today because tomorrow you may die. You say, Pastor, that's morbid. No, the Bible says that. That's the invitation that God is giving you and I this morning. He's saying, listen, you want to feed your soul on things other than God? And the only thing you're going to have left is a deeper hunger and thirst because you're empty. You can't take out your, your wallet, if I had one, and look at your money and say, feed me. Can't sit in your brand new truck and say, fill me. Am I, am I getting through to somebody? I thought maybe somebody would say, ouch. <laughs> but I believe there are people that are genuinely saved here this morning and maybe watching me this morning. But they don't like to tell you they're dissatisfied. You can sit down and talk with them. This is how I can tell a Christian is dissatisfied. The next time you have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody and all they do when you're sitting down with them and they're supposedly Christians and all they do is tell you about their problems. Well, I got this and I got this problem and I got this and, I, I, and they just go. But yet the Christian who's spirit-filled will talk about Jesus. That's the difference. Why? Because the one Christian that's dissatisfied has not met Jesus. So all they can do is complain about their problems, but the other Christian that's filled with the Holy Spirit knows that all of my needs are taken care of by Jesus. All my wants will be filled by Jesus. He takes care of you and I. He says, don't worry about what you're going to wear or what shoes you're going to put on or what you're going to eat. I am going to provide for you. Hallelujah. And that's the difference with today's Christians. They want a sugar daddy. I think I told my wife, I said, honey, I'm so broke. When we first met 31, 34 years ago, I said, honey, I don't know if you want this guy. I'm so broke, I can't even pay attention. No, but half the people didn't get that. Okay, 
Slow recovery. Amen. Amen. You know why? Because they're not eating the right food. How, many, how much time do you spend in the Word of God? At my age, I do watch TV. Because I'm too old to do anything else. But I pray. I read my Bible. But how much time do you spend versus entertaining yourself? And you're not filled because you're not eating the right foods. I see a world today of Christians trying to find a need to satisfy, to quench that thirst, and they're still looking. That's why some people, here goes, I might offend somebody, they go from church to church to church to church and say, hey, I want to plug in your church because I'm thirsty. Oh, you're not giving me what I want? Great, unplug it and go over here. And you plug it in. What can you give? That's not a church. I'm going to hurt somebody here today. And that's okay, because they hurt me 30, 38, seven years ago when he told me this. The pastor says, we don't come to church to get fed to hear the word of God. We come to church on Sunday to touch other people's lives. The spirit-filled Christians know they're looking out for that soul where they see the long face. They see them, the old people hobbling. They see the wife sitting without her husband. Why? She's probably hurting and missing the, the fact that her husband's not there. We Christians know. I don't have to tell you. We get up out of our seats after it's over, and we make way and say, hey, can I pray with you? How, why? Because we're Christians, and we love you, and we thank you for coming here, and we're hoping you come back because this is not a church, it's a hospital where broken vessels are coming in constantly. And sometimes we don't even invite them. They just stroll right in. Homeless, drug addicts coming out of prison. Broken marriages. Look at number two. People try to fill their need with something in their soul. Isaiah was talking about was this. They were not put in prison, the Israelites. They were, taking, they were taken to Babylon. Now, follow me. This is a tricky one. They were taken to Babylon. Why? Because they knew if we can separate the Israelites from their God, get them used to, the worldly lifestyle, then when a crisis comes, they won't know how to touch back with God. So today, Christians, this world, we call it Babylon, the world today. Christians are looking for God. I know they are. We're born with that. It's just that some people don't want it change their lifestyle. So they turn it off. But what happens is the more that you separate yourself from God and come into church is sort of like a barometer. Where is your walk? I'm sorry, you can't go to your television and watch five outrageous pastors in their sermons and say, man, I'm filled up. No, you're not. Your ear is bent over because you were tickled but you ain't filled up. The TV can't talk back to you. You can't see the needs of the people in the church. But there are a lot of broken people. And if he can separate you and put you into Babylon, you won't have a hunger and thirst for God. You think you look all right when you look in the mirror. Kids look okay. They're not on drugs. They're not stealing. My wife loves me, I love her, blah, blah, blah. Everything is good, hunky-dory. But you're empty on the side because you have no bread. 
Am I making sense? The enemy decides how we will break those people down. He's going to break you. If you are not searching God daily, he will break you one moment at a time. And his goal is to get you as far away from God as possible to one day you don't even want him no more. Take them out of their worship. That's why I sit in the front. I used to sit in the back. And I wonder. I'm not criticizing anybody here. So please, don't feel it personal. Unless the Holy Spirit is striking your heart. Why don't we see Christians raise their hand and praising God? <laughs> Uh, I went to a basketball game with the family because their little daughter wanted, uh, the son was playing. And all I saw in that, ba- it was a Christian school too. These, and the basketball game, they were jumping up and down, waving, stomping their feet. But how many on Sunday because it's a Baptist church, I bet you you can hear a pin drop in that church. Bing. How can they worship the basketball that has nothing to do with God, yet when it comes to God, they can't raise their hands? Why is that? Why? Because Satan has taken us to Babylon. We stopped knowing how God wants your worship and my worship. Well, I can't sing. Excuse me? I'm not looking for American idol singers. You're singing to God, and to me, it's a sweet sound when he hears your voice. Well, I don't do that. Why? Why is it you can scream and yell at a soccer game, a basketball game, a birthday party, a bar mitzvah if you're Jewish, but yet when it comes to church, I just don't do it. Why? Because you've got to realize you're in Babylon. And you don't even know it. Satan has taken you away from what true worship is. I look at it this way. I'm getting a little bit off my sermon, but I think this is important. It's like going to a restaurant. When I go to a restaurant, what's the first thing? If it's a Spanish restaurant, they'll give you the salsa and the chips. And maybe if you're really hungry, they'll give you a soup. I don't know what they call it a soup, but it's something. And then the waiter comes by and says, what would you like to eat? Of course, they're saying it in Spanish, so I go to my wife, huh? Because I don't know Spanish. And they give us the main meal. And after the main meal, they come back and say, what would you like to have for dessert? Now get the picture. Stay with me, folks. You and I, when we come to praise and worship, it's like coming in for the chips and the salsa. It's an enticement to come to feed your mouth and your taste buds for more Jesus. You may come to church with a heavy burden. Your kids are upset. They don't want to be here. Your teenagers definitely don't want to be here. Maybe you had a fight the night before with your wife or your husband or your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or your two-year-old dog. Had a flat tire on the way. You finally got your husband to come to church and say, the money ain't going to save you, honey. Just get to church. It's the appetizer that you're missing. Now, the appetizer is this. Because we have a lot of burdens, and I have burdens too. I, I don't escape that. What happens is we come into the presence of God, and there have been times I don't want to raise my hand because I didn't get into the praise and worship. I was out there doing some business. But I need to be here. Why? The praise and worship 
takes away all of your cares for that hour. That way, your spirit man is not distracted from anything you're thinking about after church. And then you're ready to receive the word of God, get built up to face what the enemy is going to give you out there. And if you think the enemy is not waiting for you, you're living in Disneyland. He's out to rob you, to kill you, and to destroy us. And he don't take no prisoners. He'll make you upset, even by my preaching. Somebody here is probably saying, how dare you tell me that? Well, guess what? You just listen because you're in Babylon. You haven't crossed over yet. Because your minute you're done the praise and worship, man, you're in his, the spirit is connected to him. So when the word comes forward, man, you're gobbling that up. Am I making sense? I got a little sidetracked, but I felt my spirit, I had to say that. Because the Satan wants to put us in bondage, folks. You've got to look beyond what you see. If you have a hard time praising and worshiping, if you have a hard time praying, if you have a hard time reading your Bible, I don't want to hear about, well, I have this condition and I have that condition. Wait a minute. Way back here in the Old Testament, it says, when you have become a new creation in Christ Jesus, all things are past and all things are new. What you did was you brought into the lie that you have never changed. And the question you have to say is, why do I keep listening to that voice? I'm a new creation. All things are possible. Pastor, give it to me. I can do it. I can memorize that scripture verse. Am I making sense? I know I'm stepping on toes. Praise God. Wear steel pointed shoes and you don't worry about it. See, Satan doesn't want to control you. Listen, he'll let you do what you've been doing. Because he knows if he forces you to come to church, to worship God, to hear a life-changing message, you'll get so perturbed, you don't want to come back there. We Christians think we have the freedom to come and go as we please, and that's Satan's ploy. Go ahead, you can miss Sunday, no problem, because he's separating you and putting you into Babylon that you don't feel, I have to be in church to worship my God corporately because it came from Jesus' mouth. Don't forget the assembling of the brethren. Why did Jesus say that if he didn't mean it? But yet today's Christians think, oh, I'm okay, look, pastor, there's nothing wrong with me. But tomorrow he may ask for your life. Ouch. Look at verse 3. We did that. Turn to Luke chapter 12. You see, the body will prosper, but your soul will still be empty. And there are people here this morning and people watching me this morning that their whole intent is to make more, be more, do more, and get more. But look what Dr. Luke has to say in his apostle. Look at Luke chapter 12. Go back to 13, please. Go back to 13 to 15. Got it? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 13. And the one of the multitude said unto him, Teacher, 
Bide my brother, bid my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Next verse, 14. But he said unto him, man who made me a judge or a divider over you. And he said unto them, take heed and keep yourselves from all covetousness. That means greed. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of things which we possess. I want you to drop down to verses 16 through 18, please. And he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he reasoned with himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have not nowhere to bestow my fruits. And he said, This is what I'll do. I will pull down my barns, build a greater, and there will be a bestow all my grain and all my goods. Verse 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be happy. He's not, listen, he's not talking about material things, folks. Okay? We're going to look at the spiritual side of it. Anytime we take our worldliness and try to cross over to spirituality, that's where a lot of confusion takes place. People like popularity, fame, ease, amusement, even sports. And whatever have you learned by doing these things, we isolate ourselves. You see, Satan does not want to put the body of Christ together to fellowship. Why? Look what we got here. All different cultures from different nations coming together, worshiping God, hearing his word, planting seeds, going out there, witnessing, and bringing new people that are lost and need Jesus. His goal is is to get you occupied on popularity, fame, ease, amusement, and even sports. To satisfy the hunger and the thirst that you've been trying to fill all this time, but yet at the end of the day, we're still empty. Because it only helps temporarily. I know, there's even people out there that like to make money but you're still empty, and that's all you do. But inside, there's still a longing. After the day is over, there's still a longing. There's something missing, honey. What's wrong with me? It's because your spirit, soul, is wanting more of Jesus in your life, not entertainment, not amusement, not popularity. Now, I may not have hit in your area, so don't sit back and say, hey, hey, he didn't talk about me. He talked about you. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I feel better now. Keep, keep preaching, amen? You, it ain't talking about me. Listen, I'm not determining if you're lost or saved here this morning. Because pretty soon I'm going to have an altar call. And it's not about your salvation. It's about you having a thirst and a hunger for Jesus. Not going to Babylon and separating you into worldliness. So you don't have a need. All you want to do is be amused. I'm not here to amuse anybody. So I'm speaking to both groups. So if you're sitting here and you're not saved, I'm speaking to you. If you're sitting here and you're a Christian, I'm speaking to you. If you're sitting here and you're on the fence, I'm definitely speaking to you. We just read Luke 16. Look at the picture. What did this fellow do? He pulled down his barns to make a bigger barn. Isn't that what America has taught? Now, we have people from different nations. I hope you don't pick up our customs. Please, stay with God. But Americans, all they do is when they reach a form of wealth, 
they build a bigger barn. They work harder to obtain more. Bigger car, bigger house, better clothes, better jewelry. And they're looking to build bigger and bigger. But the Luke says later on, Jesus says, you're a fool. Yeah. You're a fool. Because tomorrow I'm demanding your life. And what is your big barn going to do for you then? Okay. Ah, you can't do that. I worked all my life. Who cares? Look at verse 19. But God said to him, you fool. Ah, gotcha, huh? You thought I was making fun of somebody here. Pastor, why you call me a fool? I didn't. God did. This is the very night your soul is required of you. That should put fear in your socks right now. Somebody here should be feeling it. I got a call this week. Our prayer meeting. We have a men's Bible study of pastors during the week. And we take a book study and we study the book and then we talk about it. This particular day, the instructor says, anybody have a prayer need? And the man says, yeah, I may have cancer. But you know what? You looked at his face, no change. Yeah, he's in the cusp of life and death. But the man was still solid. Wife was a little bit more fragile. That's, that's a good wife. But the question is, where are you sitting right now? If Jesus was to take your life tonight, would you say that you would be in the presence of Jesus for what you've done for God? Or have you spent all of your time building bigger barns, building a better lifestyle, having more fun and entertainment, having the peace of having family around you, that all they do is talk about their problems, but nobody in there says, you know what, how about we stop and let's praise not a simple prayer of praying for the food. How about we do a mini Bible study? Because I bet you when you gather with your families, somebody is not saved. Yeah. Somebody is a backslidden Christian. But we don't do that. Why? Because we want to fill our barns and have people come back and visit us. Am I making sense? And now who will own what you have prepared? Who's going to take it when you leave? I told my wife, honey, I sold my house. I said, honey, when I retire, we're going to hop in the RV and go and spend every dime. <laughs> Just joking. As a result, what happens to certain people is emptiness. Do you know why God called him a fool? Because, here it goes, listen. Because God, he recognized his problem. He recognized that there was a problem that he didn't have enough space to put his possessions, so he had to build a bigger barn so he can, his greed, his covetousness, and you can sugarcoat it all you want with all kinds of adjectives, but it was his greed that says, i got to build a bigger barn. That was his problem. His problem is he didn't see what God saw. He was a businessman who thinks, I can solve all my problems, yet everything is collapsing around you. Everything that you hold dearly is going to fall apart, folks. I don't care what structure you built for yourself and your family, it will all come to dust. So he called him a fool. You know why the cry is? The thirst? Why is he thirsting? It's in here. 
Do you think what you're doing is going to satisfy God and your family? Ask yourself that question. You're sitting here and you're watching me. Is what you're doing right now satisfying and pleasing to God, or you're just building a bigger barn so you can stuff more things, more entertainment, more amusement, more things? But yet when it comes to God and serving him, nobody's around. What's wrong with that picture, folks? What's, folks, what's wrong with that picture is they're still in Babylon. You're in Babylon, and you're not crossed over to say, uh-uh, devil, I know what you're trying to do. Why is it when pastor makes a call, I'm too busy. I got this to do, that to do, this to do. I'm too far. I'm too close. I have no car. Guess what? You're still in Babylon. And you're trying to build a bigger barn. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. I'm closing soon. Getting there. Hold on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Hallelujah. So when you start to think about what you're doing in your servitude to God, if you have to think about it, you know you're wrong. Just say, Lord, I don't understand, God, why I have to do these things, but I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to lead on my own understanding. I'm just going to trust who you are. Look what he gave to us, everlasting life, but yet we spend our time amusing ourselves instead of flooding our hearts with more of Jesus. Your soul, somebody's soul here is crying out to God this morning. You know it's you. You've been fighting it. You've been struggling it. You've been empty for so long. You've tried everything you wanted to fill that void, but it hasn't worked. Do you see the contrast? Which one are you? You want to be like that foolish man and build your barns? Or you want to be like, say, Lord, I just want to come and not lean on my own understanding. And I'm going to trust you. I want to help people. I want to serve God. I want to serve the church because I know we're serving people. That's his promise. The problem is when we have become so deceived Listen to this, and we're so good at covering up. We have all the excuses why you can't serve God. You cover it up pretty good. But what do you think is going to happen when we stand in front of God? You think he's going to buy that bill of goods? No. Well, I did it one time. Okay. What are you doing tomorrow? Oh, there goes your schedule. You know what also? It happens to people that want to get married. He or she thinks that getting married is going to satisfy all their problems. Hello? You are just going to offer, open up another book. And guess what? You may have more trouble. And you're better off staying single. You just don't know what he's all about. You don't know what she's all about. You say, ho, ho, hey, uh, uh, honey, can I just try this out for six months and see if it works? It's not like buying a used car, folks. So how do you, how do you deal with falling in love? Oh, but he's so handsome. Look at all, look at all those muscles. And he turns to her and says, wow, she's gorgeous. Hey, when you get married, she'll get old and, and you'll get fat. <laughs> then where the love is. Every time I walk past my wife, after taking a shower, I have to suck in my belly. I say, honey, I still look good? <laughs> and, and then she goes, let your stomach out. <sighs> Now look in the mirror. Oh, wow, you're a party pooper. <laughs> Do 
You know where the cry is? They're thirsty. Are you thirsty this morning? You want Jesus to fill you up? Look at verse 7. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. And let him... Re okay, leave 6. And all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your ways straight. Yes. Leave it there, leave it there. You following this? Yes. Not your understanding, his. When you put God first, he's going to make a straight line to heaven. But when you start taking authority over your lifestyle, all of a sudden you have a crooked path. And everything goes wrong. Can I get an amen? amen. And if anybody ain't saying amen, you're a liar. Amen. And the truth's not in you. Amen. Look at verse 7. I'm just getting started. And all your ways acknowledge him. Look at me, folks. That means in the good times, and the bad, in sickness and health. I forgot the rest of it, honey. This part. You know, when I met my wife, I was 30. I was, I was 36 years old. She was 34. And guess what happens? We made a, almost like a contract. We were seasoned Christians. We wanted to serve God in some capacity. All that hoopla back here of amusement, games. What do you think, I grew up this way? No, I didn't. Had a hard life. But we made a, a promise that even though we may have disagreements, even though we have fights, and most of the time it's me causing them. But you know what? One word that never came out? Divorce. But yet, right now, today, there are more Christian marriages divorcing than secular marriages. Why is that? Because you got married for the wrong reason. You're saying, she is my deliverer. And she finds out she wakes up with curlers in her hair. And then she takes off this, and she takes off that, and she removes this. God, who is this? Oh, Lord, help me. That wasn't in my notes. question is this morning, you heard me, we talked about Isaiah thirsting after, spiritually thirsting, talked about Luke and building barns, talked about Proverbs walking the straight and narrow way, not leaning on your own understanding. Are you still satisfied with trying to build your barn? And if you're not saved here this morning, this would be a perfect opportunity to say, you know what, Pastor? I thought just coming to church every now and then to Sunday service, I'm going to get to heaven. I had somebody the other day tell me, I'm a good person. Really? Did you ever cheat on your taxes? Yeah, once. Did you ever look at a woman, a second look when she walked by with that sexy hourglass body and you did this the second time? Did you ever take a pencil or a paper clip or something from work? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know the Ten Commandments? Yeah. Well, guess what? You just broke three of them. Not only you're a liar, you're a thief, and you're an adulterer. And you, you mean to tell me that God is going to allow you to get to heaven because you say you're good? The Bible says we're like filthy rags. The Bible says the only one who's good is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by Jesus. Amen. There's no one good. Amen. You know what that person did to me? He walked away. <laughs> Go 
Go ahead. I can't save him. I'm only a, a messenger. Like today, somebody here is being touched. Somebody here is going to be transformed. God says, spend more time feeding your soul. Because when you leave your soul unfed, unfed you're in the wilderness. You're out there in the devil playground. He'll twist your mind. We got people that are depressed. People are lonely. People are desperate. People are trying to commit suicide. Why? It's because they forgot to feed themselves on the living water. Amen. God is spiritually right now crying out for somebody. It could be more than one. I believe in the last days there's going to be a flood of people coming through those doors that have a spiritual need that they've tried to fill and it hasn't been filled. They're not looking for a church so they can go to a church and they have the hoopla. I went to a church one time. I couldn't believe it. Mega church. And here it was on Christmas time. They had two angels flying across the, the arena with wings. And I'm saying... I, I get it. Another time they had animals, elephants, giraffes on the stage. Another time they had guys wrestling on the mat. And it dawned on me, that's why people flock to the big churches. First of all, they can sit back there and know what is, notices who they are. Secondly, they're there because they're being entertained. But yet, you get to these grassroots churches. You know why people don't want to come back? Because they don't want to change. They want to hold on to their pet sins. And they say, Pastor, you can't do it. You can't change me. Go right ahead. But eventually, God's going to say to you, like he said in Luke, you spent your whole life building barns. You fool! Tomorrow, your life is required. Like that pastor who has cancer. But he, he knows if he lives, he goes to heaven, he still lives. There's no difference. We're in the flesh and the spirit, but if he takes us home, we're still in the spirit. He had perfect peace. Do you have that perfect peace? Do you worry about tomorrow? Don't do that. Worry about today and today's problems because tomorrow will have their own. The emptiness that you may be feeling right now is that God has not forsaken you. You may be sitting here and you don't feel anything. You know why? It's because your tank is empty. And you need to fill it up with Jesus. You've tried everything your way, and it hasn't fulfilled your joy and peace. I go back to Isaiah, verse 9. You have 9? Here's a key right here. Isaiah 55, 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways. That means God's higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Go to verse 6 and 7 now. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. And let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Verse 7. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to God, our God, he will abundantly pardon. Look at me, folks. You're going to have to make a decision today. I'm not talking about where you are in Christ Jesus. But I'm talking about those Christians that have spent their time filling their barns. And then I'm going to speak to the people that are not saved, sitting here and have not made a commitment. I had one person tell me, I'm thinking about it. 
I'm like, thinking about what? I'm thinking about whether I want to go to heaven or not. That's a good choice. I'll pray for you. That person never came back. I pray that he heard a life-changing message. Somebody waters, somebody plants, somebody waters, somebody gets the increase. Maybe he wasn't ready. Praise God. I hope his day will last longer than what the Bible says. Are you hurting this morning? After hearing this message, can you say to yourself, Pastor, that's me. I'm hurting. I understand it now. I didn't understand it before. Here it goes. Number three. Thank you for being patient with me. Everybody that's in this church knows I'm a teacher rather than a preacher. I break it down to where even a child can understand it. Look at number three. Repentance is not a feeling. A person can be sorry. Peter and Judas were sorry, but yet Judas went out there and hung himself. But Peter, after he cried for a little bit, came back to Jesus, and he repented. Many cases where people, the Bible, people have sinned, but they never changed. Repentance is not just coming here to the altar and saying, I repent. And yet when you leave, you go right back into your same lifestyle. That's not repentance. Let me explain. You can be double-minded like Balaam who sinned but never changed his lifestyle. King Saul sinned and wasn't sincere until he died. Esau cried out with many tears, but never repented. It's not fear. It's not feelings. But conviction. What's conviction, Pastor? I think many people that come to the altar, they thought they were repenting, but they were not. And the reason why they felt a conviction was this. Pastor, does repentance involve conviction? Yes. Is it conviction? No. Listen carefully. This is going to decide the altar. When you come into God's presence, he will start to move on your heart. Don't look to your wife and look to your husband and say, do you want to go? Uh-uh. It's an individual thing. This is not a family affair where you get coupon rates by coming to the family. And when you come here, you don't come here talking to each other. You're coming here in the presence of God because he drew you to the waters. Am I making sense? Follow me. He'll start to move on you lightly, and all of a sudden, maybe you'll start to cry. Maybe you'll start to weep. Maybe even shake because the message hits you so hard that you can't contain yourself. And all of a sudden, those cries start to wane. Then you start to feel the conviction. You're going through what's, no, what's wrong within you because the word of God has now pierced your hearts. Repentance is when we turn and go the other way. Too many times we sin. It's called roller coasters, repentance. Sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. You know, it's not a Catholic church, I'm sorry. You don't go to the altar on, on Saturday night and, and, and give them all your sins and you're clean, and then Sunday you go to church and receive the sacraments, and then Monday you go out there and live like the devil again. No, repentance means you change your lifestyle. And for some here, like I spoke earlier, you won't do it. You want someone just to tickle your ears so I can feel good just for a day. You know what God's going to do in your response? When you truly are convicted and repent, he's going to come with compassion. The day I walked down that aisle from back there to here 37 years ago, nine months, and he told me, God wants to blot out all my sins like it never happened. 
when I made that trail down the aisle, I was shaking, weeping, crying. When I got to the aisle, I couldn't even look at the pastor. And he said, look at me. And I'm weeping. He knew I had a move of God in me. So when you come here, it's not laughing and joking. You better off just stay where you are because you're not ready yet. It's not repentance when you have to talk to somebody at the altar because God is moving on you, not on your neighbor. Am I making sense? I hope I don't sound too rigid, but I got to explain what it means so you can understand. Look at number five. We're going to wrap. Look at number four. I'm sorry, number four. He will move upon you with divine faithfulness. God says, when you cry out and thirst after me, I will see you and my word will come to you and comfort you. You just found out you got cancer. God says, I'll meet you right where you are. Maybe you're in a state of depression. God says, I'll come and meet you right where you are. You, be, you can't even make it to church on Sunday. I'll come where you are, and I'll just fill you with my love. I'll pour my grace upon you. And if you sin, my mercy will forgive you. Why? Because he knows our hearts. But if we're sitting here playing church, guess what? You're on your own. Friends, you're on your own. And I don't know about you, I don't like that being on my own. My honey goes, why don't you go in your RV and, and, and go for a ride? I said, I can't. Why? Because you're not with me. We're, we're one. Five, he will answer your thirst with joy and peace. Why do people walk into church? I'm not picking on anybody, please. Don't pull out your derringer. Don't do that. Women, keep your shoes on. But you come to church with this long face. Man, what happened? Did somebody die? If they did, fine. But if not, why are you so sad? You're coming into God's house. You're going to meet Jesus. Man, I can't wait to find out what he has to say. And then when the praising, well, I know my wife talked about it. One day we're going to have that band. Maybe somebody here is going to say, hey, I can play a keyboard. We got a $5,000 keyboard sitting on ice. We got a $2,000 drum set. We got guitars. We got tambourines. I know we got the singers. Pray on that. But that joy and peace comes over you. Are you seeing the picture? Peace comes over somebody who's repentant because of the conviction. The thirst now is being satisfied. It does not mean you can't go out there to the parks, have a picnic. It doesn't mean you can't go to a football game or soccer game. No, I didn't say that. But that when you replace that for God, that's wrong. Put God first and everything else follows. And you can enjoy your family when you do your outings. Because now he knows that he will be in the center of that outing. But that young man, he was just building his barns. He didn't have any joy and peace. All he wanted was more. Stand. Hallelujah. I kept you along. Praise God. Oh, man. Amen. By the way, for new people here, I'll speak to you later about that. Here's my first altar call. I want you, everybody, don't move. Just bow your heads, close your eyes, turn off the phone. Do you have a thirst? Answer, answer that question to yourself. Do you have a thirst? Now that we know what thirsting is, for more of Jesus in your life to put him in the center of your life. And if you, you can't answer yes, and I'm not just talking about coming to church on Sunday. I'm not, coming, I'm not talking about coming to Bible study during the week. 
All right? I'm talking about each and every day. He is at the core of your lifestyle. And when things go wrong, it don't matter because you've got the perfect peace and the joy. Now, if it's not being satisfied, I want you to start moving forward. Remember, it's not about sin. It's not about uh, salvation right now. It's about the fact that you're not being satisfied. You're thirsting for more of Jesus. It could mean that you're following Jesus, but something now is empty. You know why? He wants to fill you with more. Don't be complacent with what you got. I come to Jesus and say, Lord, give me more. Give me a double portion. I'm not satisfied with what I got. I want more of Jesus and less of this world. If that's you, come. Now, listen. Secondly, if you have not surrendered to God and you've looked to people on the outside to solve your problems, but yet you're still empty. Your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, sister, brother, husband, wife, children, you've called them up trying to solve your problems, but you're still empty. I ask you this morning, is there an emptiness in you this morning? Do you feel empty on the inside? You've tried everything to fulfill it, and you've come and you want to confess in him. Come right now as the music plays. Hi, I am so glad that you connected with us today. My name is Linda, and I am co-pastor at Breath of Life Church. We are located right beneath the beautiful South Mountain in the valley. We believe in building community. We believe in strengthening families. And we do that together, walking alongside as we're learning and growing from the Word of God. So we hope that you will continue to join us and visit us. And we believe, as our mission says, in loving God, loving others, and serving the world. Life is always better done with another. That's because God designed us for relationships, not only with Him, but with one another. Fellowship Nights provide a place to connect with each other and grow with Jesus. In the book of Acts, it mentions, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. If you're not in a life group, then this is the perfect opportunity to get connected. Here are a few of the groups we have going on throughout the week. Rock Solid is a study group designed for Christians who wanna know how to read the Bible. This is perfect if you've just been saved or if you wanna learn how to have a relationship with God. Looking to find a ministry in the church? We can always use a helping hand around Breath of Life. Whether it's helping in kids' life or making sure our church stays clean, remember, the Lord sees everything you do. Wherever you go, He is watching. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. Scan the QR code or see an usher to see how you can use your gift from God to better His kingdom. Parents, have you brought your children into kids' life? In Building B, they'll learn what it means to be a Christian. Our teachers help guide the young disciples through the Bible with fun and interactive lessons. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. If you're prepared to give today, I want to remind you that there are a few ways you can partner with us. You can give online at breathoflifeag.org slash giving. And the easiest way to give is by scanning the QR code on the screen. You can easily set up a recurring gift on our website, as we're showing you right now. We've made it simple to give automatically from your credit card, debit card, or checking account. Life gets busy, and this is a great way to put God first in your finances. It takes less than two minutes to set up a recurring gift, and we've made it simple and convenient for you to give online through our secure platform. 
or you can always mail your check or money order to our office. And if you're with us in person today, you can give by putting your tithes and offerings in the basket that our ushers will be passing out in a few moments. Thanks again for being such a generous church. Hey church family, have you followed Breath of Life on social media yet? We have content geared towards our community that will keep you up to date with events going around the church. Follow us online on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Join our community online and stay connected with us today. Welcome to Breath of Life International Fellowship, your spiritual home in South Phoenix. Are you seeking a place where you can connect with others who share your faith and experience the love of God? Look no further than Breath of Life International Fellowship, conveniently located at 202 West Dobbins Road in South Phoenix. Whether you're a longtime resident or new to the area, we extend a warm welcome to first-time visitors. We believe in the power community, and we're excited to have you join us on this incredible journey of faith. As a first-time visitor, we invite you to fill out our new welcome card. This card allows us to get to know you better and stay in touch. Simply visit our welcome center located near the entrance and our friendly volunteers will be more than happy to assist you. After filling up the card, please see one of our ushers who will guide you to your seat. We understand that some of you may prefer a virtual option. To make it even more convenient, we have a QR code displayed on the screen. By scanning it with your smartphone, you can access our online welcome card and provide us with your details from the comfort of your own home. Remember to see an usher upon arrival for further assistance. At Breath of Life, we believe in creating an environment where you can grow spiritually, connect with others, and make a positive impact in our community. We offer a wide range of programs and ministries for all ages, including engaging worship, inspiring sermons, small group gatherings, youth activities, and much more. Join us for uplifting worship services that will nourish your soul and inspire your spirit. Our passionate and dedicated pastors and leaders are here to guide you on your spiritual journey, helping you depend on your relationship with God and discover your purpose. So whether you're searching for a place to call home or just curious to learn more, we invite you to experience the warm embrace of Breath of Life International. Visit us today at 202 West Dobbins Road in South Phoenix. And remember to fill out the welcome card. Don't forget to see one of our friendly ushers at the filling out the card who will assist you further. We look forward to meeting you and sharing the joy of fellowship together. Breath of Life International Fellowship, where faith comes alive. Are you looking for a place to call home? A place where you can find a community of believers who share your values and beliefs? Look no further than Breath of Life Church, our doors are always open and we welcome you to come and join us for our weekly worship services. We understand that attending a new church can be intimidating, which is why we've made it easier than ever for you to connect with us. All you have to do is fill out a contact card and we'll be in touch to answer any questions you may have. Whether you prefer to fill out a physical card or scan the QR code to fill it out virtually, 